Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. Do you love our content and want to see us expand? Support us on Patreon. We're just getting our start with producing video content as well, and we can put more time and supplies into this endeavor with your support. Additionally, we are putting out a bonus episode every week where we review tournament stats. It is available on our Patreon to subscribers only. Hope to see you there. In today's episode, we have a conversation with Shane from Command Point, where he brings some insight about Hyrotech Circle... Um, at the time of the interview, he was about to go into a tournament, and we've actually heard back since then that he did, in fact, go 4-0. Are you excited to play higher tech? Play, tell me you're playing higher tech, Shane. You didn't, I am you're... playing higher tech. Oh, I'm actually, yes. I, was, uh, I was just painting them before they, I got on here. So I'm not going to lie. After like writing the article on them, I was like, this looks fun. I just need to get a box. But the box I bought for my shop instantly sold. <laughs> like, crap. Uh. No, so I'm waiting good. for another one to show up, but I, I, I probably will buy them because I do I do kind of just want to play them. They look fun. I mean, Ace just dropped a tier list on Goonhammer and he put them at A tier. Like their win rate kind of reflects like a B plus A, A minus team anyways. But I yeah. think having written that article and gone through all of their strengths, I think if you play to mitigate the downside of like any one turn might not go that well and you're just playing for the end of the game, you can mm-hmm. just have like a full on game plan now. Yeah, we're back with Shane of Command Point, friend of the pod, multiple time appearance. Yeah, what is this the third? I think appearance? it's the third. Yeah. third. Yeah. Wow. Have you? Am I the first third time returner? Is this a, is this a record? Uh, got the hat trick, and the hat trick is a robot hat trick too. Because I think every time you've been on here, you've been talking about higher tech. I think you might be right about that. Actually, <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> but this time it's different. Higher tech is good, actually. Now, because I really believe now. Yeah, it's like, what's the difference like between when like people didn't think they were good and they and they're good now? So I think every time I've talked about them on here, it's it's been post when they got buffed. So like, I think for me, most of it has just been the more I play them, the more I think they're strong. And I'm at a point now where I actually for a long time, I wanted them to be good and I wanted to believe they were good. I just didn't think they really were deep down. But I actually do believe now that they're they're very, very good. I think they just required a change of mindset. I think looking at how people approach games, because I think one of the things that you, Jason, you did at LVO that I thought was really good is instead of playing the boring three, three split game, you're just like, I'm just going to leave my home objective and go to your like, go to your opponent's objectives and score theirs, which means that they either have to break your lines or they give up their scoring and higher tech kind of do something similar over the course of four turns. Yeah, they. They move the board really well. Like they just slowly move up. And by turn four, ideally, you've just like dominated the board. Yeah, there's like nowhere to go by the time you're at turn four, right? Like because they are reasonably hard to kill. Like, yes, plasma kills them. But anything at AP one doesn't really remove a model that efficiently with three up saves, 10 wounds and healing two wounds a turn. Like Mm -hmm. you actually don't go down to anything outside of AP two guns. And even when you die, you still get back up, hopefully, over the course of the three turns left over. So if you alpha strike someone and nuke someone and they plasma you back, you're like, all right, cool. As long as he gets up somewhere before turn four, I will score central control and whatever the whatever the tack op is that everyone's using now, right? Yeah, that's been one of the big things for me is the faction tack op. Uh, it's unyielding ancients. So myself and a lot of other players, I think, used to, and I think a lot, a lot of people still do, they would take... Faction tech op. I think it's two. It's unearth Unearthed. artifice. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, they're playing so, like with, with recover items. So you're like, oh, I'm going to do two recover items. But yeah. And like in a vacuum, like the, I'm sure a lot of teams, if they could take, if they had a tech op like unearth artifice, it would be amazing for them. But having to do a two AP action with higher tech is really limiting. You who have so little APL on the board. Um, and it's like a two turn investment, really, unless you like allocate resources to actually make sure you get it turn one 
So, um, and then you need to be there at the end of the game. Yeah. So it's like, like, especially if you want to take another tack off that also costs actions, like you don't have enough for that. Yeah. Um, exactly. So like if, and that's why it was particularly bad with recover item, in my opinion, even though that's what people would do is because that's two things you need to do. And my general approach now with higher attack attack ops, and I said this to somebody recently, is if I'm putting my operative in a spot to score attack op, and if I can look at it and say, would I want this guy to be there if I wasn't scoring this attack op? Like, would there be another reason for me to be there? And if the answer is no, I just don't take it. They can't do too many things at once. They only have like 17 APL. Um... And it's it's tough to like they just they need to be using all of their actions for killing things or playing primary. And then on turn four, you just score your attack ops. And that's been a good strategy for me so far. That's like 100 percent the exact same thing I've been saying about elites all along. Mm-hmm. So I'm like with Phobos, I don't yeah. take specialists um, with intercession. It's just like just go do the thing like you have to spend 100 percent of your APL to kill stuff or score things. Yeah, you can't be and doing you- random side quests. Like, it just, it's not fun. And with Heretech, you know, you have literally some of the best shooting in the game. Like, if you have a reroll, it's literally crack grenades all the way down. And the crack mm-hmm. grenades slap everything. And also, yeah. Immortals are not bad in melee. Con- considering, like, that they're s- slow robots, they end up doing a pretty, pretty appreciable job against most dorks. Like, sure, the veteran guard is going to tie you up, but you might kill them if you have lethal five. But generally, you're just going to have someone else nuke them. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's pretty nice. Like you you can against the seven moon chassis, you just kill them in melee. Everything else, your melee is good enough where you can probably parry out at least. Because the other side of it is a ten wound body is hard to kill for most other like baseline melee. So they're gonna struggle to kill you, and you have a good profile to parry them out. Or if you have the lethal five, you might just spike and kill them back. That happens a lot. So. I think a long time ago when you were on here, we were talking about how higher tech is blooded's worst matchup because they just like the quality of the melee attacks will just never get through. I don't know if that get was me that said that, but I can see it. I haven't played that matchup actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah, do I've think heard, blooded... I've heard that the chaff, like the chaff, chaff squads, just have a rough time against four attacks on threes, three, four, sometimes with lethal five. And if yeah. you kill them, they get back up, move away from you, and blow you up again. <laughs> I, I do think Blooded in general like doesn't play the mission as well as the other shooty hordes. Like they don't have like out of turn movement like Vetguard or Pathfinders, so they can really struggle against Nanomine. Like they can mm. get super pinned in their drop zone. And I, in general, I think they struggle to alphas more than uh, most hordes. I agree with that as well. Yeah. So when it comes to like the operative showdown. Operative showdown. <laughs> Where where are you at coming into Adepticon nowadays? Like, are you planning to just spam the nano mine, or do you have plans B and C <laughs> locked away in the Tesseract vault? No, you just spam nano mine. It's <laughs> it's like it's actually the thing is is for a team to be like really like tournament winning viable, they need to have one like just broken thing. And Hyrotech has the nano mine. It's completely broken. It's way too toxic. Um, it, it should get nerfed, but you like can't nerf the nano mine without hurting higher attack too much. So like, if we're lucky, they'll do like a balanced thing where they like they internal balance the team, but they usually don't do that. So I'm not holding my breath. If I had to guess, we'll just see toxic nano mine forever until unless higher tech becomes OP, which I don't know. <laughs> All it takes is a few nerfs to other teams, and then maybe higher tech is actually a problem. What is higher tech's worst matchup? Uh, so I think. Generically, I think commandos should be tough for them, but I think they're better against commandos than like ninety percent of teams. Um, they probably struggle in uh, same deal with Vetguard. Um, exact same principle. I think it's a hard matchup, but they're still better suited than a lot of teams. Um, I think Elucidian Star Striders is actually a difficult mission for them uh, or matchup for them. The assassin is just like a major issue. Um, and on top of that, they just the damage reduction is really annoying. So like you're, I don't know, on open board, you don't have like easy ways of killing anybody, really. Um, like even the basic guys can like live if they get lucky on an armor roll, which they typically do once in a while. Um, and honestly, this is a weird one, but exaction squad is decent into higher attack because... <laughs> 
your shooting, all of your shooting reliability comes through rerolls and then six inches for the most part, outside of just like hitting on threes. And their models are eight wounds. So the chassis is decent. They have four up saves or three up saves. So if you're shooting at them within six or outside of six, you're probably not getting rerolls. And you're just hoping you roll well and they don't. Um, and you can't ever, like we were talking about how higher tech melee into like the hordes is good against, you're never going to do anything against the shield guys with higher tech melee. It's just, you're just going to bounce off. So I think that exaction, the, the other flip side of it is that exaction isn't particularly good at dealing with you. So it's just like a really like grindy match where not a lot of stuff dies, but that matchup was tricky when I played it. I feel like that's like a universally true thing about Exaction Squad is just like yeah. they're just like a pain in the butt for everyone and it just comes down to the dice. It's like your strategy is just like hope for good dice. Yeah, that team yeah, definitely does does give the feeling off because at LVO, everyone was like they came in pretty like, oh, yeah, they're going to do well. And then they <laughs> all of them did like, OK, and they had like a bunch of Felgor in melee that they thought like this should be good, but you know, four on fours, four on threes with a bunch of random no rerolls. Like it just it's literally all coin flips all the way down in the melee section. Yeah. Like last time I actually looked at somebody showed me stats and it might have been Dakota or somebody. But like exactions win rates are like respectable. But they're as far as like placings and like podiums, they are just the bottom of the bottom. Like they don't win anything. Um so there's think- definitely like a ceiling with that team. Hitting on fours is yeah, it's just like not they're not consistent enough in melee to kill stuff. So they're like, yeah, you get stuck, but then everyone is stuck. Like you're stuck, they're stuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's tough. Do you find that you're using any of like the important tricks at, or like what are you taking outside of nano mine then? Because nano mine is obviously the thing that you're always doing. What's the other cryptex spell? Because you get three out of two. Uh, chronometron, the chronometron. Um. It is. It's funny because like it's already not fair enough that Chronomancer gets Nanomine. I think Chronometron is also the second best Cryptek power across all nine. So it's like it's not even like if you just nerf Nanomine, I'd probably stop. Like I'd probably still keep taking Chronomancer unless they like buff one of the other ones. Um, because Chrono Chronomon. Sorry. Oh my God. There's so much. Chronomon. Yeah. Chronometron is um. For those who don't know, it's plus three inch movement on a guy and a five up field no pain. So one of the key strategies with higher tech is the Despotech missile, which I think we've talked about before. And you give that guy the chronometron and three APL. And if you have intractable march up, he can move. I believe it's nine inches, dash three inches and shoot something. Or he can charge 11 inches, fight and shoot something. And this is the guy that hits on twos in melee and shooting, and he gets a free reroll um, with demand. So he is just like an absolute... He's the killer on the team. He's the best offensive piece on the team, which is funny because I feel like for most teams, the best offensive piece is like the leader. It's the leader of the but, plasma gun normally, and generally yeah. those kind of coincide on many teams. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the Despotech is the best killing piece, and you can have him launch like 12 inches down the board and just delete something and then you can have the cryptech command him to overwatch and kill something else right after so you get a lot of like really good offensive turns out of that model that is pretty sick um so is there any like how many uh death marks do you take um is that like a one. fixed that's like one is always. that like always one or like sometimes drop him for something else there is like a world I think where you can drop Deathmark, but I haven't found it yet. <laughs> um, I think the Deathmark's amazing. Like it has such a good four deploy. Um, it gets around like, like I don't know, just the the ability to because it's having to like being able to drop him outside of six of your opponent's DZ and outside of six of enemy operatives. It's like if you drop him early, you can put him like on most of the anywhere. board. Yeah, you can yeah. hit any mid-board objective, typically. Um, so that is really nice. And I found that having another source of 3-plus Overwatch for command is really good. Um, and in general, I, I play him pretty aggressively, and my opponents never kill him because they're always worried about the Cryptech and the Despotech. So the Deathmark is, like, maybe third on that list, and they just don't usually get to him 
So he can put out a lot of damage. Like, you can deep strike him behind, like, a door on Octarius, and then he can dash through next turn and shoot somebody. Um, or he can just, like, be an objective monkey, and then if somebody gets too close, he shoots and kills them. And maybe they kill him, but then he reanimates, and he kind of gets, like, he all this extra all movement. Again. Yeah. So, and like... He, the, when people aren't killing them, is that because it's like a threat saturation then? Like the other models are like on engage and they're like coming out and like beating people up and sealing your objectives. Is this like leaning into the, the alpha strike or do you like go for the kill on turn two? It's a lot of threat saturation. I try to in, in general, if I can't alpha turn one, I'll try to send the despo up to deal with something on the midboard and regardless i try to have a really aggressive turn two um where i'm trying to kill a lot of stuff so deploying the death mark pretty aggressively or on advantage like where i can see objectives and like overwatch later is also good um but yeah like you said i think it's a lot of it's threat saturation because like we were talking earlier about how they're not easy to kill so like the cryptech and the desp attack especially whichever one has the chronometron because they have a five up feel no pain. It's like a multi-operative effort to kill them. So like they only have so many like opportunities where they're like, I'm going to go for the death mark instead of the cryptac who can fly 12 inches on a CP and blow me up. Um, so yeah, he, he just usually gets to do things like my opponent never wants to deal with him because he's always like lower on the pecking order, but he does hit extremely hard. Like, four shots on twos, four, four, AP one, Mortal Wound one is a great profile. That crack grenade on twos. Like, that's... Yep. Yeah. Everything is a crack grenade. It's just some of them have yeah. different words attached to them. And then on in the dark, one of the cool things is you can just switch over to Teslas and then just nuke people with lethal five up. Yeah, a lot of people say that uh, higher attacks are worse on Into the Dark, and that is maybe true, but um, I think most of the... It's mostly just different. Um, because... Flat out, our shooting is better on Into the Dark because the Tesla is better against pretty much everything. So, like, that's the one easy tip is if you're playing on Into the Dark, just take Teslas and your Immortals. Don't even think about a more uh, Goss. And so, like, because the, the Tesla with Lethal 5 is better than anything else you can take. So, like, just flat out, your shooting's better on Into the Dark. It's a lot easier to get within six for Relentless Onslaught, so you're getting your rerolls a little bit easier on Close Confines. Um, you can still alpha on close quarters, so like it's not like that goes away. Um, they're one of the few teams that can turn one first activation alpha um, on ITD. And otherwise, I mean, I don't know. It's like you get to score your objectives easier. You can go on engage turn one easier, which being able to go on engage turn one with a lot of your guys cascades so much gameplay into turn two. Because first of all, on turn one, if you're all engaged, you can intractable march and then you have like normal movement. Um, and the bigger thing is on turn two, let's say you win initiative, you now have like so many options to do command overwatch from, which makes your first activation so much better. Because if you're playing against a team where you like you're on open board and you're playing against a shooty horde, you're going mostly conceal. And then turn two, you win initiative and you want to go first to your crypt tech. You don't have everybody's concealed, so you can't command anybody to Overwatch. So like the the punch of that first turn is a lot worse. Whereas if you're everybody's engaged, you're gonna like kill something with the crypt tech, tap a point, you know, maybe you'll cast a power, and then you'll tell your desperate tech to kill something. And maybe if you blasted and the desperate tech shot, it's pretty normal to be getting three kills on that activation. So yeah, I don't know. I don't mind into the dark because I think you can do that a little more often. I'm just curious on In the Dark, do you actually take the equipment to make your splash three range instead of two range? Just oh, because yeah. then, you know, people are just, if you don't space out, you're going to get nuked. And lethal five on five dice with a reroll, that just means that a lot of things are getting chip damage. And that can be really, really rough for horde teams. It's so good. It's it's crazy how like, because if say you're playing against a horde and you nuke a guy and you do like one mortal, even just one, usually you'll get more than one. Uh, not usually, about half the time you'll get more than one on Lethal 5. Um, and then the other seven wound models and three of them are now six wounds. And now your melee is just much better into them. Like you don't even have to crit to go kill them. And it, it adds up quickly too. Uh, it's so strong. And you don't usually, a lot of people get scared because you're going to splash onto yourself. That does happen a lot. 
don't worry because next turn you just regain those wounds with living metal you usually don't feel it so i just kill the thing you want to kill and regain the wounds and you're probably fine I really like what I'm hearing here. Uh, I didn't need to get this tempted to play higher tech. Um, we'll see how it pans out. Meanwhile, you know, yeah. Jason is out here saying he's going to take six incursors out to Adepticon. <laughs> and just and start no sideboard, people. just six incursors. Like, I've, d- I've done a bunch of games with that, and it's been, like, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's just, like, and it's, this, it's, it's a the- lot of similar concepts where there's, like, threat saturation, like, use your Overwatch, but, like, with incursors, Everybody ignores obscuring, so everybody is covered by somebody else's Overwatch. And then if you push super duper hard and you cover every single objective marker, it's just like you've got one plasma gun, and I'm like, yeah, shoot me, I don't care. I've got like you kill one, and then I kill your plasma gun, and like four other guys on turn one, and everybody's happy except for you, I guess. <laughs> it's cool. I'm so you know I'm like I'm excited to see that at Adepticon. Um, are you doing the pods, Jason, on Thursday? I I didn't make it in through a wait list, but I'm going to oh. just like try to get in anyways. Just show up. Because I'm going to be there There's a lot already. of pods. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in pod four. I'm tempted to just like, because usually somebody will bring a different team for the pods and like mess around. I think I'm going to bring higher tech to pods and just run Technomancer. <laughs> just just to have fun. Because I have him painted. I don't have the, the, the Psychomancer, Psychomancer built. Yeah, because he's... He's not good, and also he's a major pain in the butt to build. I don't know if anybody's ever built that model here, but oh my god, it's horrible. If anyone has built them, yeah, post the pictures in our Discord because we are down to see this incredibly. I mean, it looks really cool. Like it flows. It's got like lots of movement, but yeah, I can imagine that it's just like four different connection points all held together by like one small join. I mean, it's a really cool looking model. We've got uh, we've got a local guy, uh, Ted. I've mentioned him before, um, who's been running the Psychomancer a bunch, and he's just been like nonstop. Like the like the main team he plays is Hyrotech Circle, and at our our like last big tournament, he was just like alpha blasting everybody with his ap2 splash blast and just like murdering everybody and turning up people's rerolls and he was he was really like cracking some skulls with the psychomancer yeah he's i think he is better than the technomancer um his powers are better and it's just like both of them pale compared to chrono it's weird because they're all better at different things like technomancer has the best gun if you're not counting blast um and the psycho has the second best power group uh the trauma conjure trauma is really good just like select a guy and they're permit injured basically um the other one i forget what it is it's like uh you just pick an objective visible to you and it's like you know it's like a reaver standing there yeah um and then there's another one where like you the psychomancer casts it and then enemy operatives within six of him like can't retain crits and they also yeah, can't roll anything they can't it's both yeah yeah it's uh so, like, foster lumens plus yeah it's pretty if funny all, i feel like if he could take all three powers like out of the box he'd be really good compared to like the two powers of the other ones just because you would have like yeah you could influence so much of the board but because he is you know you get two and then the apprentice has to go do his work he's like a little, a little bit harder to use for sure yeah i agree I think his power, his power group is, is pretty cool. Like with Chronomancer, I never am like, man, I wish I could take the three up in Vuln. I never found myself wanting that. Like, I'm sure it would be nice, but not to the point where I would take it over a five up feeling of pain and plus three inch movement. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's rough because like he does just enough, like the Chrono, Chronomancer does just enough on everything else where because his powers are so much better than everything else is like. It's hard to justify to yourself when you're trying, like, I'm going to be the most competitive thing. I need to take the most efficiency and then build a game plan around it. It's hard to say, I'd rather take two niche powers that are extremely good and then like an OK gun versus like he's got a good enough gun. He's got yeah. excellent powers. And then you've got the Technomancer is like, I used to be relevant because I used to do something. First of all, Techno should have more wounds because he's so big. Give he's him like huge. two more he's wounds. He's a fifty he's, millimeter base. He's giant, and I want the techno to be good because he's the coolest looking model. Like maybe in Kill Team. Like I'm sorry, that model's so awesome. Um, he should be cool. Like I remember that when I the first time I saw him in person and on like a Kill Team board, it was at uh, KTO last year, 
and it was like Chris and Glass Half Dead were playing a game, and I walk over and Glass was playing Higher Tech when they were like a complete joke team. Yeah. And I walk up and I just see the gigantic Technomancer, and I'm like, holy crap, that's not real. It is, real. it is a sick model. I, to be fair, I think the team is just, it looks really, really good, especially with the newer paint jobs of not having everything be Lead Belcher <laughs> plus Null Oil. Yeah. Yeah. I've just been doing, I'm doing mine with uh, like Zara Khan. So I just dry brushed him like, rune lord brass mm. um and uh going going for a little green you know uh pretty basic not going too crazy with it but so yeah they're, definitely yeah. they're great yeah so you're you're gonna you're thinking about noodling around with the technomancer in the pods uh what are some combos you've got uh ready for that the, the technomancer has no combos he's just cool he has a good gun um and the Apprentech becomes like a third reanimation bot, basically. Like you have the reanimator, you have the Apprentech, and you have the ploy. Um, and that's pretty nice. Um, I wish it didn't cost an action to like have that bubble turn on. I wish it was just like passive. But um, it is pretty cool how the. Um, it can, because like sometimes you can run into situations where, you know, you use your reanimation and then somebody dies that's not near re your reanimator but like if you just had one more bubble you can kind of hit most of the board you know just um and, and then it's like you can potentially have like three guys reanimating if you have a really bad turn so like i think the technomancer has more potential for comebacks like if you're in a really bad like attrition spot like you could just have a lot of guys come back all at once um but uh no, in general, I think you just have a little bit more flexibility in terms of how you use the the Technomancer because he's not as desperate to like be casting a Cryptech action every time you go with him, and his gun is really good. So he literally just has a Soul Reaper cannon. Like his gun is a Soul Reaper cannon. It's six shots on threes, on threes, three, 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 four, three, four, one. Yeah, yeah. And you have a reroll within six, and if you shoot through the Apprentech, you get like Cult Ambush reels. So he's just like insane. Um, so you can use him as just an offensive piece. And that's pretty nice because it's like the Chronomancer, he can be an offensive piece, but that's not really like his main job. So like having a Technomancer and like having another guy that can kill most things is kind of nice. Um, yeah, really hitting like massive threat saturation because you have a ton of people that now hit on twos because you've got two crack grenades on twos with, you know, one reroll or, you know, no rerolls. And then you've got six dice on threes, three, four AP one, sometimes with reroll one type, which is yeah. basically just five hits, which is yeah. probably enough to kill most things like most non elites. Five hits AP one is probably just going to delete. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, that's the thing. Like, Chronomancer is very, like, combo based, I feel, with, like, Chronometron and stuff. But Technomancer is just, like, uh, he's kind of a hammer. Like, you can heal things. I would probably take, I don't know if I would take heal or the never injured, because how often are you even injured with higher tech anyway? With, especially if you're, you know, with the way they buffed reanimation protocols, you're pretty much coming back with six wounds minimum eight wounds maximum yeah, so, you can't be injured on the way back up so there's really yeah the power two for nano nano scare report repair swarm is just not not doing the thing that clearly the technomancer was put there for like before it was yeah. like oh every once in a while you'll come back at four wounds so coming back at five now matters but it doesn't happen anymore yeah like it is nice to get one extra wound back on living metal but I don't know how big that is. And like the other thing too is like even if you are injured, Necrons are pretty fine when they're injured. Like their movement doesn't really get worse. Um and if you're shooting, you usually have balanced, so like it's manageable. But I guess I don't know. I don't I don't run into situations very often where my guys are injured and I'm like missing shots because of injury, but I don't know. Heals can be nice. Two D three heal six inches away is actually quite good. I've learned from playing Felgor a little bit. Um, oh, that's <laughs> that's such a rare thing, actually. Like a six inch range heal two d three is is sickening, <laughs> especially on a flying guy like who is three of it's still, it's a th it's still a three inch heal for him. It's with oh, visible it? and within three of him. Yeah, yeah. But because uh -huh. you have, you could theoretically get on the apprentice. Like you have 
you know, maybe other positions that you could think about doing it. But it's not one inch heal, which is which is big. I think the only six inch healer is I the Felgor has it, and then also Soul Weaver on the Corsairs can also heal at six mm-hmm. inches, but it's D three each time, so it's pretty slow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but well, that the, tells you how uh, how much I've played Technomancer. I thought that was a six inch heal. So <laughs> Yeah. I mean Technomancer is a three inch heal, but it's two D three, which is very important especially when you're running around getting back up at like five wounds it only gives you d3 in those cases but if you've just taken chip gaining 2d3 back definitely can unchip you and turn you back into a full threat Mm -hmm. yeah um he it's an interesting because like you can either kill something with technomancer or move dash heal somebody and you know it's it's all situational but I think it's okay. There's like potential there for him to be like average. I mean, um, maybe you'll play him at pods and you'll get a feel for like, oh, maybe yeah. I will try this at some point in a real game. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with the with the combo of healing everyone and the fact that he himself is a hammer piece, it kind of seems like he makes the whole team more of a hammer piece with like the regeneration and the durability. Yeah, but you just have to find the spot to take him because you wouldn't take him against hordes because he doesn't have blast. So... Maybe into elites. Like again, this is all based on a, a future world without nanomine. Like I guess into elites, maybe um, he can. You just having another like big damage piece. Um, so I don't know. Uh, but they're definitely like, and it's funny because I'm not the only one doing well with them either. Because there's a we're actually doing CPTS North America right now, um, and and Europe obviously, but the world's the world's biggest you know kill team tts tournament yeah 115 players we hit which is i think the third biggest kill team tournament like ever Mm -hmm. um so but in the north american bracket we had 61 players and six round swiss so just enough for one undefeated um and there's we're finishing up round five right now and there's two undefeated there's two five and o's there's myself playing higher attack and there's another guy playing higher attack so the the all finals is higher attack which is hilarious it's, it's funny because me and jason over the last couple of weeks we've been doing a little patreon specific stat show for anyone you know who is interested in the patreon we do a recording on monday looking at the last week of stats and there was a small period of time where higher tech was like crushing it for two weeks we we're like oh shit it's like 50 50 in russia they were like 60 something percent we're like there might be some real legs on this so hearing at cpts you know the largest tts tournament right now we have two five o's in the north american bracket on higher attack you know there's definitely definitely some are you both playing similarly where you're both playing security or are there different play styles actually um you know? so his his name in discord is omega tahu if anyone wants to reach out to him um and in the lead up to cbts he was very active on our discord in the higher tech channel and initially we had a lot of differences but i think we've slowly like started to merge our play styles there's still some differences he doesn't like deathmark so he, I don't think he uses oh, he's just Death not Mark. using it. Whoa, that's actually kind of so. that's crazy to me. But um, sure, okay, yeah. So like, whereas I take it every game, tech up wise, I he I think he uses recon more than I do. But I think in general we both use a lot of security. We both take unyielding ancients. Um, and yeah, I think we're playing pretty similarly. We're both leaning on nanomine and chronometron. Um. And yeah, but the only real difference I can think of is is the death mark thing. It's a pretty big difference, I think, just having, yeah. you know, whether it's one CP to be used again for something else during the course of a game that mm-hmm. means that you don't have a teleporting piece, but it does mean that you have another consistent gun, I guess, in the back line. Not not really. So it is it is a pretty interesting difference. But maybe that one CP means that you get a cortical subjugation or leech power that your opponent can't play around. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't usually run out of CPU with higher attack until like turn four, and by then it's fine. But there are definitely moments where, you know, like obviously if you're in Into the Dark and there's not a door for him to walk on and open, which will happen sometimes, I think, then I suppose in that case, you, I, I've, that's the situation where I would consider not taking Deathmark. Um, just because the mobility of the Immortal is going to come in a, a little bit more there. But I don't know. It's a tough call. And I before this tournament, I haven't done it once on the tournament. But I did like the theory of giving against hordes, giving the grenade to the death mark. So that way, he has a way to move and maybe kill something. 
Uh, but Maybe I haven't done something it. with, you know, silent, like, you know, you can go anti silent someone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something like that. But hasn't come up. I have found situations where uh, my plasma sites are shooting things a lot and it's really funny. It, I would assume that without the without yeah. the death mark, you actually do free up a little bit of equipment points, I assume. And maybe that is also nice because now all your immortals have lethal five up in melee or something. I'm actually not taking the death mark equipment too often unless I really in some matchups. I like it um, I like against Felgore. I think it's really good to get the crit. Uh, but a lot of the time it's like like if you're against eight wounds, it doesn't really matter. I guess it does matter because you can injure them a little easier. But um, like every time I shoot my death mark, he gets a crit and then the equipment doesn't matter. So I don't know. Maybe I'm just lucky. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a it's definitely a cool team that's definitely been on the upswing, I think, in terms of a lot of people's opinions, because I think, you know, this time last year, they were not even in contention as a playable team for competitive players. And I think they've been like slowly drifting up. And now the win rates are showing, I think, that they have hit a good spot on the meta. Maybe they are a durable enough shooting team to deal with some of these melee menaces now that some of them have take, been taken down just a little bit. I don't know if they're great against Felgor. What, what are your opinions against them and Felgor right now because Felgor and Chaos Cults are still kind of like the top end of the melee meta and Commandos obviously are still pretty good. You said that higher tech are pretty solid against Commandos but what about Felgor and Chaos Cults? I think Felgor, Chaos Cults and Geller Pox too. I think higher tech, I think they just beat them. I think it's a winning matchup for higher tech which is one of the reasons I like them so much. Um, it's like what I was talking about earlier, you can go pretty much full engage and it turns on your kit turn one and it opens up your play turn two um plus nanomine exponentially hurts melee hordes more than it hurts shooting teams so you can pin them back really really badly like i think in my round five game that i played last night for cpts it was against uh brandon bean the blooded mm. Pacific yep. Northwest player and he's playing chaos uh, cult from seattle like the seattle area he went to the world championships yes. on blooded he's a great player he's a nice dude so Definitely, you know, high pedigree as far as competitive kill team goes. And he was playing Felgor. Chaos Cults. Chaos. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. He's on the Colts and he yeah. just got stuck. Yeah, I won the game. It was very close. Uh, he's a great player. And it went, it was like a super long game because we don't have clocks until cuts. So mm. I think we played for like three hours. But um, it was uh, 16 13. It was open board loot. Um, okay. So not so, our favorite mission for either of us, but. Open board favors me for sure. Yeah, I mean, mission wise, I think it's okay for him just because he has enough dorks to go loot. But mm -hmm. on open, obviously, your kit is much better against his kit because he's going to take a little bit longer to ramp up. Yeah, and I guess, you know, if a chaos cult goes in, kills one model, you reanimate it and then everyone else just blows it up, right? <laughs> yeah, and I've played against chaos cult. Uh, I think chaos cult might be the team I've played against the most, maybe with higher tech, just coincidentally. I think I've played the matchup like four or five times. And you know the um, you know the Chaos Cult side very well because you were playing them in the middle of last year when you got your yes. first ticket. And I haven't lost to Chaos Cult with Higher Tech. Um, I've tied a couple times, but uh, it feels really good. Felgor, I haven't gotten the chance to play, so this is all theory, but I, I suspect the same. It's all the things that I like about the Commando matchup are true for the higher or for the Felgor matchup, except I don't have to worry about shooting, so it's a lot easier. Um, and then Gellerpox, we just crush Gellerpox, I think. Like, we we have s access to stun. Um, the splash three inches just, like, incidentally is just actually killing things. <laughs> like, yeah, because like there's dying. Two, or two and three wound dorks in the background. So you, yeah. you hit the one glitchling, and then it just, like, blows up one of the yeah. other dorks. Because three, inch, three inches is hard to avoid. It's it is. In to avoid. Yeah, for a 15-model team, it is. Yeah. Um, Round four for CPTS was Into the Dark, Secure, and I played against Geller Pox, um, and I won that game. Uh, and it's just very, like, that's the game where my plasma sites were doing a lot of shooting. <laughs> um, and it's, it's for, for context, it's, it's a LAS gun, so four shots on four is two, three. It's three-inch range, but they're always going to be shooting with balanced because of Relentless Onslaught. So you're killing Glitchlings, pretty much. Um, I had... Uh, a nightmare hulk that was a problem near my dz and i had to send both plasma sites over to shoot him and then they have so many more activations than me that both plasma sites got to shoot and overwatch in the same turn and they took like 
11 wounds off of this Nightmare Hulk and had him down to, like, almost nothing. Um, it was really funny. Uh, don't ever melee with plasma sites, but the shooting is okay. Yeah, three okay. three attacks on fives, one, two for melee. Not it, but four no. attacks on fours, two, three, range three. At least that is a real profile. It's and not balance. good. Yeah. Once you get within three, you're down to three shots, though. True, against a glitchling. But against yeah, yeah. the against the Hulks, you're you're good. Yeah, you can but avoid don't it. Don't the Hulks have that too? It's a two-inch two bubble. Two inches from yeah. Hulks. Yeah. It went from six and three inches to That's right. three and two, because God damn, that team was impossible to fight when it was a yeah. six inch bubble on glitchlings. And they had five up feeling bands. Oh my god. Oh um my god. but yeah, that and like using uh the nano mine to just like stop. You just pick a nightmare hulk and they just don't do anything for like three turns because they're on the other side right. of the nano mine. Um so that's pretty nice. I so I think higher tech beats all the shooty or the melee hordes. Um I think that they are barely losing to like the Octarius teams. Um if at all on Into the Dark they probably beat Vetguard and that's probably like pretty Man, I don't know about Into the Dark against Commando. Man, was, Commando's kinda of rough. The Rocket Boy getting lethal five definitely doesn't help. Yeah. It's tough. Um I've played against Commandos once with Higher Tech and I did table them um and win, but it's like it, there's so many wounds to chew through and you have to respect shooting and it's annoying. You, you've also you also know what like other top end players play like on commandos and it can be very rough to get in <laughs> when the shooting lines are just covering all the melee dudes. Yeah, it's tough. Um, <laughs> and then the random bomb squig sweeps around the corner and nukes yeah. nukes a dude and a half. You're like, fuck. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. Although using the nanomine to shut down bomb squig is really funny. That's true. Um, I did do that in the game that I played against them. Like, cause he was in charge range, and I just drop it, and now he's not in charge range. So, um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, other matchups, uh, as far as the, the shooting hordes, lines, you know, there's like the pathfinders on the top end. I assume can feel kind of rough, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. It was yeah. always, to be fair, from my side as a pathfinder player, I played against like Compendium Necrons. Like, this is kind of hard because your guns yeah. aren't great at killing 10 wounds three up saves in cover yeah. so you can kill them fast enough but when they get up you're like oh crap now i gotta do it again so you have to kill like three or four models a turn which is something tau can do but yeah in return all of your dudes disappear instantaneously so yeah it might not you kind of have good. to play a higher tech as like a melee team against pathfinders i think yeah um just like load up on bayonets and maybe you don't take death mark there and you just and I, blow, I, yeah for what it's worth, I think like higher tech are probably fairly good against the elites right now because your guns are so good at blowing them up and you can take, you know, you can have like the defensive line get hit by the assault intercessors and then get them back up and shoot them. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, Pathfinder is probably tough. I'm like trying to think about the tier lists right now and like work my way down. Oh, Void Dancers, um, I assume could maybe be rough. Yeah. But I, mean, I assume I assume that you should be fine most of the time just uh, pure like weight of dice on shooting because void dancers have always had a rough time against shooting centric teams i played against void dancers with higher tech in my local league like a month ago mm -hmm. and um he was making like every single four up save it was insane i still ended up winning but it was like oh my god i i've i've i'm like shooting you with tesla like getting five hits and you're living over and over again i'm like just die <laughs> like like i don't know um but yeah if they spike saves it can be hard but um not too bad i think against elves they're just good um i like them against hand of the archon because you go teslas and they don't even get feeling the pains against the mortals so that's pretty funny um i think that's something that jason told me like way way back and like blew my mind i was like what do you yeah. mean you don't what do you mean you don't get saved against mortal wounds yeah so if they take two mortals then it's like oh they're like real damage yeah like even one more die yeah one yeah, they, they take... that's enough to bust through their feel no pain yeah so they like usually they just like only make one yep and it's like they make one on eight damage like so on seven they're making it a little bit less often and you know even i don't know it's just pretty nice um you know you just you brought up uh, your the Rochester League. How's the scene growth? You know, I think the last couple of times you've been on, it was a smaller scene. There was a tournament that you did run a while back. But, you know, it's been a year since then. You know, catch us up on how how northern New York is doing. It's going well. Um, we had our league. It just finished. 
Um, and we had 15 players and there was a Pretty couple good. that weren't able to play. So I know there's more. Um, and our tournament to like cap that league off is tomorrow morning, actually. So I'm going to that in the morning. It'll be done by the time listeners know. So hopefully it'll be up on the UTC recap later this week on Goonhammer. <laughs> yeah, I'll be playing uh, higher tech there. And there is going to be some good players. Um, there is some people coming in from Canada. Mm. Uh, this the guy. Toronto crew. Yeah, Jason, I believe his Jess name Boone. is. Yes, also Jess on Boone. The, came on the podcast. He's been killing it with Felgors lately. So he's he's probably bringing his Felgors down. So that'll be a good test if I get to play him. Um, and, you know, the locals, they're getting a lot of them are learning right now, but they're getting better every week. Super cool guys. Uh, shout out to everybody that's been coming. The league ended two weeks ago, so we've only had one like regular meetup since then. But it's been uh, it's been cool. Um, scenes looking good. Yeah, I mean, whole league plus a tournament coming up. We've got some people coming up from Toronto. And it's good because you're close enough to the Eastern Canadian scene where there can be a little bit of crossover back and forth. Because I know you went up for a tournament at the end of last year. No, it was around this time last year. Okay, Um, yeah. And we because we actually have a discord called Great Lakes Kill Team Mm. where it's the it's like Western New York and Ontario, Canada, like all together, like one big discord. Um, so we use that to like share all of our events and stuff. Um, I was going to go to one last month, but I, I had to cancel like last minute. I felt really bad. It was the Torchlight Games tournament. I was signed up mm-hmm. for that. You'll notice that that had 17 players. Well, there had there was 18 seats and I was supposed to be 18 and I had to cancel on like the Friday before I felt terrible. Um, but yeah, I, I want to go to their events because they're the closest community to me actually yeah, they're, they're somehow closer than new york city proper because it's like a five hour drive right <laughs> yeah it's literally about half the time to get to new york city um but yeah uh so it's cool to see them i know liam and mark garrett were gonna come up for the tournament but i they're not able to make it after all but they were signed up at one point i think they've been a lot busier this year too just with like the kids growing up basically <laughs> yeah. you know, for yeah. listeners who have no idea who we're talking about there's like a family on the east coast that makes it to all the tournaments i think the whole family went to the world championships to play yeah they're all really good you know they're um, great players but yeah the rochester scene's been been doing good and we'll see how the tournament goes tomorrow i'm hoping we can hit like i'm hoping we hit eight to ten that's kind of my goal i think we've got like seven pre-registered already so we'll probably hit uh, eight, know, eight mr Watkins. Eight. Eight people's not bad because you get like a nice clean three round like capstone compared to yeah. once you get to more, you got to play the fourth round. But I think for a lot of newer scenes, like three rounds is kind of the sweet spot because a lot of newer players are just like, it's a lot. It is <laughs> it's a yeah. lot on the day of competition for four rounds. Right. All right. Going to jump in real quick with a quick shout out to our sponsor, War Games Atlantic. War Games Atlantic makes sick miniatures for great prices. Each kit includes enough parts for 24 models with loads of special weapons. It's great for your Astro Militarum factions, Trader Guard factions, Kasserkin, stuff like that. Um, and it's also awesome for any other miniatures agnostics games that you might play, such as The End. Message me on Discord if you want to learn more about The End. Check the show notes for a link. Anything that you buy through that link will support the podcast as well all right back to the podcast uh what are you guys going to do for terrain for that tournament uh open and it's the dark not beta decima uh, the open is going to be a kind of a hodgepodge of like a little octarius we're going to have a chill Neth board i think we're going to have an lvo-esque board mostly i think it's pretty much an lvo board um and it's we're going to have quite a few into the dark setups so not a fan of beta decima no it's just too weird we actually it's funny because for our local league each week ryan set up the tables so that there's one beta decima one or two into the darks and then like a few open boards so every week a different person a different pair of people were playing on beta decima and by week five we're like setting up at our tables and everybody's like avoiding the beta decima table they've all played on it once and they're like i don't want to go back there that was weird um and it's just like because like we had a Geller Pox player that's pretty new that played on Beta Decima and it was just the worst. Um, like, I don't know. It, it's I don't disagree. I think melee teams definitely struggle. And there's like a handful of boards where melee teams just can't play like those five, boards five and six where there's two vantage points that just look down the alleyways like mm-hmm. there's nowhere to go. There's no interesting decisions to be made. It's just run 15 dudes down the corridors and see who makes it to the other side. And it's like 
it's yeah. not not great but like i also, think some yeah. of the boards are kind of neat it's just you know some people yeah it, they're hard they're hard they're hard to make work right now it can feel like a normal game um like between two experienced players um at the obviously at the highest level we all know that there's like clear discrepancies some factions just have tools that are better but i think at lower levels especially beta decima can feel really bad if you don't know like a lot of the intricacies so i i've been i'm not like discouraging my locals from playing on it but i'm not pushing them towards beta decima i guess it's the expert level board in a field of you know there's already tons of stuff that you have to know to play on in the dark and open to really play at a higher level right like in the dark especially yeah. has all these teeny tiny tricks of like knowing how engagement range works around doors knowing where you can or cannot be shot or what's safe and what the actual movement is be around doors because a lot of people don't realize that you can phase through the one inch on either end of the door so it's a little bit more permissible than it looks mm -hmm. there's a lot yeah. of that stuff for sure. Are there any uh, big tips for other teams? I know when we were coming in to talk about this, I knew we were going to talk about Higher Attack Circle. But before we lined this up, you were like, maybe I'll talk about Handy the Archon. But it sounds like now that Depticon has been lined up as like Higher Attack time, your brain's all all circled out. But, you know, what what about Handy the Archon was like scratching the itch earlier? They're just like a very killy team. And I like... I was telling people they feel like uh, like elf legionnaires. Um, and I was really having fun with them. I just hate their action economy. Um, their action economy is horrible. And I think like it's hard to ever get two for one. Like because the you start out with terrible action economy and like your way around that is you throw the bomb at them and then you give some of them terrible action economy because they're perma injured now. Um, and outside of that, the only way to get double kills, assuming you don't have a pain token, is blast. So your opponent has to like give you a blast, or the Crimson Duelist like charges two guys and kills them both, so your opponent has to like let you do that. Um, so like a lot of it was just really rough for me. But like once they get going and they snowball, they're brutal. So like... And I've, if I'm not mistaken, they're a team that's like always had a pretty high win rate since they've I been released. Every elf team has always had a high win rate. I think because they break so many of the basic like movement rules of the game, there's mm -hmm. a knowledge gap for new players where you're just getting like tabled by elf teams. Because like Void Dancers have permanently been at 60%. Yeah. They just have never won a major tournament since then. Because yeah. you get to the top end, someone knows how your team works, and you lose. And that's pretty much every elf team, I suspect is what's really think, happening yeah maybe not corsairs they're a little harder to pilot um but like hand of the archon they're definitely a bit of a pub stomp team i think if you're better than your opponent you're just gonna like maul them with hand of the archon but like i think you'll hit a ceiling with them pretty quickly where the stuff you're using to like gain advantages isn't working anymore um and i just had if if anybody's interested in i mean shout out to brett i just talked to him on command point um brett from six-sided legion who uh i think he plays 10th at lvo with hand of the archon and i have like an hour long chat with him about the team up on our youtube channel but um he's he's a really good hand player he's and a, i think it, he's a nice dude too yeah he's a cool guy um yeah the six-sided legion have been you know they're great yeah Met shout out chicago to forever ago and you know they've been around and they're they're both really nice dudes yeah so like yeah, I mean, hand is sweet. There, I felt like they, like that that torment grenade is really toxic. It's really like annoying to play against. Um, and I think they have a really cool toolbox. I just their action economy gets in the way for me, and it's it's the reason I'm not playing them at Adepticon because I did consider it. I think in the dark specifically, they struggle a lot compared to most of the teams because you have nine dudes with two action, two AP and no real tricks like you've got to get the first kill somewhere or you've got to be within six inches of the flare so you can get the first pain token on someone else. So you mm -hmm. can basically pivot off of something. But it does mean that you have to preset all of your in the dark movement to like have three dudes open doors and three guys to go do the mission objective. And it yeah. just makes you very static. I think because can you roll a crit? was really into them but he said he had to drop 
literally a playbook for every in the dark map because they are trash on in the dark <laughs> with doors yeah and it's like regardless yeah. of what your opponent does you have to stick with that plan and that's like a that's a weird way to start your game and maybe even worse than Insta Dark with them is like loot. Just period. Just <laughs> playing loot with them is just dreadful. Because like you can't on turn two realistically be in a position to kill something and loot. Because you need to already have a pain token, which if your opponent's playing safe on turn one, they're not going to give you a kill. So like you're not going to get a pain token until you already kill something on turn two. So then like and then they need to live till turn three and then you can activate them with three APL. And like maybe then you can go charge loot a point and kill something, but it's like it's really tough. And if the other team is like has any GA two, then they can just like starve you out of the primary, and like it's rough. It really turns into like the pressure is really on you. It's like a such a desperate scramble. You you have to just by turn three and four, you have to like completely shut them out and just like try to you know like give them like a zero point turn four. Just supreme, yeah. but like playing that aggressively is just like too risky to be sustainable. Yeah, and like legionaries, you have to start out passive, right? Like if you're playing legionaries or something or intercession, but at least they're like they have the action economy when they need it to like have that explosive turn to in hand of the archon. Just can't do that, or not without your opponent giving you a mistake that lets you slingshot, mm -hmm. which is not. Obviously, for high level play, you can't be depending on your opponents to make mistakes. It's on you to like force them to make a play that's bad. But that's hand is not great at taking punches. Yeah, you know, you've no. got the flare who's like, oh, I've got a six up field, no pain, and I take minus one damage. But even in cover, you, you're not you're not eating a plasma. You're eating like any small arms fire. But yeah, you know, that's not that's not quite enough. <laughs> eating one plasma and dying is definitely not what you want to be doing with them. So you're not going to be catching that kind of mistake. Yep. Yeah, no, it's it's tough. Uh, I thought about playing Felgors a little bit too, and they're definitely great. I just don't have a ton of fun with them. I think one of my locals is he's basically he skipped our first round of our uh, competitive league, and he is currently I think tying for first. But he says he doesn't have fun playing Felgor. Like it's you just you do it. They are very good and they're hard to beat, but maybe not the most inspiring to play from time to time. Yeah, and I my prediction uh, we don't have any like rosters out yet i think felgor is going to be very popular at adepticon i just they think are. where they like they're the they're the s tier team that isn't commandos and they're like they're cool and i think it's going to draw a lot of players to them i think they're also around. people say that they're really fun to paint they take contrast well they so are. it's like like they're they, so fun to paint they're dynamic sculpts they've got like lots of fur so it's like they take a lot of painting techniques very well and you can push them really far, which does help. And I think, you know, in our Monday stat show, we saw that they are like 5% of the metagame right now in the world. <laughs> and commandos yeah. are the most played faction. They're like 8%. Space Marines are all around like 5%. So they're like a very appreciable part of the meta and they mm -hmm. will not lose to Space Marines or, you know, a lot of the a lot of the other teams. Just yeah. like on raw numbers, like it's very, very hard for a Space Marine, Space Marine team to beat Felgor. Which yep. is a great spot to be, you know, just wailing on what is generally like 30% of any any major tournament. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I I think there's going to be a lot of Felgor. Commandos, obviously, there's always a lot of Commandos. Um, can't do anything about that, but it's uh, it's probably going to be... The balance uh, team can fix it. They can save us from the 11th activation. Oh, they got to... Um, but yeah, I guess I'll, I feel like I'm going to have a lot of opportunity to play higher tech into Falgor next week. So, Good luck. And Jason, you're you're out here sporting the elite still. That's the plan. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking at uh, running the six and cursors as I've mentioned several times. Um, it's I I don't know. I mean, the terrain at Adepticon is. I mean, last year it was like the Octarius stuff where there's like a, a pile of scrap on top of the vantage point. So like it's you can't climb on things unless you go all the way to the midboard. Um, but with like Phobos and Vanguard, like maybe you can pull it off and maybe it's worth it. Um, but yeah, if there's if there's way less heavy terrain, it's just going to flop and fall apart super hard. So um, see how it we'll goes. See. Yeah. Uh, are you excited for any of the major releases? Because I know Adepticon has a couple of releases, you know, before we're, this will be coming out the week of Adepticon. So are you excited about any of the new teams? I know we've got Mandrakes and 
Night Lords coming out, they both look very cool. You know, Night Lords have yeah. probably pieces that people have been feeding it for for a long time because it's we finally got the Night Lord bats without it being disgusting resin. <laughs> oh man, I want to play both those teams. They look so cool. Like just the models look so cool. Um, last edition, I played a lot of uh, Mandrake spam with Tricari, and now it's like that's a thing again. Um, obviously, Night Lords, it's another crack at elite teams which obviously i haven't been like the highest on them in competitive but like i'm curious to see what they do um it's it's got to be like pretty interesting i I would imagine because it's like clear it looks to me just looking at those sculpts it's it's not gonna i don't think it's gonna be like a phobo style thing i think it's gonna be a killy team they look killy to me so if that's the approach, I feel like I'm going to enjoy the team, and I'm excited to see how they spin it to make it different from Legionnaires. Yeah, uh, and I've been. I'm like, if I end up playing Nemesis Claw, I'm probably going to uh, kit bash the upgrade sprue with Reavers. Oh, that's the way. I just have like Space Marine <laughs> Reavers, but with like Nemesis Claw weaponry. Yeah, I mean that would make sense, right? But what are you going to do for the ventrilo- the, vent- the like the guy with like the the it's icon? It's just going to be thing. a Reaver with a dead guy on a stick. All right. Okay. Or, or you know, just have a cape that's just like a dead marine falling behind. Yeah. <laughs> just like flayed on his cape, flayed into a cape. Yeah, that would be sick. <laughs> just have like a rib cage hanging off of your night lord. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think the teams look super sick. I think that you know, legionary they've carried space like chaos space marines for a long time, so it's nice that we're gonna get a chance at a different kind of flavor, hopefully. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to both of those teams and ho- looking forward to see what you two do at Adepticon with, you know, Jason being wild as always and Shane with the new meta, of course. Yeah, as as everybody knows, the, <laughs> the higher <laughs> the tech meta. Um, no, Jason, I hope we get to play, man. That would be that would be the funny matchup. The thing cursors versus higher tech. Agreed. Uh, do we have, do we like lock in lists or like can uh, we can people at the GT just like decide day of what they're going to play? I think you I don't know if there's a deadline for the list. If there is, they haven't made it super clear, but they sent everybody the registration links today. For I saw BCP the registration link, um, but there was nothing about like choose a, like nothing forced anyone to choose a faction. Yeah, no, you don't have to choose a faction yet. Um, I already put my list on there because I know what my list is gonna be basically um but yeah i don't know i don't know about a deadline yeah i've I've, my backup plan if i if i like look at the pods and can change my mind and i'm like too chicken on not enough heavy train is uh the same concept but intercession nice (laughs) um yeah six bolt rifles three scopes and just like uh play security um, and then actually, it's kind of similar to uh, some stuff you mentioned at the very beginning, where I would actually play for indomitable superiority, and that is outnumber your opponent and hold an objective while not allowing your opponent to hold a single objective. Oh, God, and you, yeah. You only reveal it, reveal it at the very end of the game. So it's just like you're doing the thing. And people are like, uh, what did you not score? And then you're like, I didn't not score anything. Indomitable yeah. superiority. And then you literally just choose the the one point that you funnel everybody into. And at the end of the game or like somewhere in the middle of the game, one intercessor that's injured just like hides and scores points. And then the one guy just like funnels you onto the last point, And then you both stand on the point and the intercessor controls it. And then you max it out. And I've done it, it like three times in a row, okay. which isn't like a ton. But I was like, yeah. OK, there's yeah, there's something there. Um, there was a guy at Worlds. He wasn't doing that with Indomitable Superiority, superiority but there was a guy at Worlds playing Intercession running security. Julio, right? Yeah, Julio. And he yeah, did. Really so know. actually part of part of this whole journey was Julio came onto our podcast after the World Championships and then him and Jason brainwashed each other. <laughs> Yeah, oh we, we kind of like smeared our tactics together. And then I was like inspired by that and brought some of that to LVO. And I only dropped two out of nine games with my intercessors at LVO. Um, oh, this reminds me. I wanted to bring this up before we ended this. Jason, you like Doom Guys, right? Absolutely. That's your thing? Yeah. Have you? I, can I interest you in a Hand of the Archon Doom Guy, the, uh, the agent protagonist, where you give the Cabalite agent and you make a, a, a custom specialist and you give him... A fourth attack in melee, so he gets three, four, four attacks. You give him lethal five in melee, 
That's three equipment points. You give his uh, splinter rifle three four instead of two four. That's you're only on four equipment points now. Uh, you give him uh, uh, what's the other thing? You give him the plasma grenade. So now you're at seven points, and banner. you give him the the cabalai banner. So he counts as three APL and objectives. So he's nine and points. The chains there, so no one can and run. Then, <laughs> and you give him the chain snare so nobody can fall back from him. And he's a melee beast who can shoot too. He does it all. He's three APL. He's a beast. Uh, it's like a specialist. If that guy was a specialist, you would take him. <laughs> right? That's a hundred percent the same way I was looking at the Doom Sergeant. I was like, you know what? If if you could just not have equipment points, but you have a guy that has uh, four dice with a reroll, hitting on twos, P one, four, five, lethal five, can ignore obscuring. You're going to take that guy every time. Yeah. I don't know if that's good, but it's funny. That, and, that was uh, my LBO build. build. Uh, and I, it worked really, really well. It worked really well. well. It was literally... We have video footage of an entire room of people going, oh, we, don't know what, we don't know what's happening over in Jason land. It was like nine games in a row of Champion of Mankind. Oh my god, I love it. Um, and like even the games I lost, like he was just slaying everybody. Like my, my game against Jeremy Carnucci and his uh, Tyranid Hive Fleet, which is just a nightmare for intercession. Um, yeah. The Doom guy killed all three warriors in two turns. Oh my god, I love it. It's disgusting in the best way possible. I, I lost, but I was yeah, like, that, the that one thing I like... want is just the absurdity of Doom Guy killing fifty-five wounds worth of big bugs in two That's turns. That's it. You just, well, you the hand of the archon hell divers. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know if hand of the archon guy is that good. <laughs> he seems very utility and fine it's against just maybe a... exactly seven wound models. He seems good even because you can charge someone, they get stuck, they can't leave. You just wait until the next turn, kill him, and then charge someone else. Now you've got the pain token. Yeah, but even it's a lot. And then, of... and then even better, you give him the omen. You just be dumb. Oh, you yeah, make yeah. a decision. Oh, shit. Now he's that useless. <laughs> yeah, that's actually not the worst thing I've ever heard of for that team. <laughs> it's probably not good, but it is kind of funny because really then funny. you can do you can like have the flare set up the pain token. And then he can like charge someone or you like shoot someone, charge someone else, lock them. And then next turn, he's like ready to go to do it again. Yeah. Um, it's I, beautiful. I've got to throw out on the topic of uh, ridiculous doom guys. The th this is like two half doom guys that are corn legionary. Um, one of them is the chosen because he automatically gets crits. Therefore, he automatically heals every time he fights. And then he's got his four, seven lethal five with the plus one damage. He's doing eight damage per single hit. You just like charge into somebody, eight damage, auto kill someone, ch chain lightning charge into someone else, eight damage, kill someone else. You just like tank more shots and then just like run through and eat everyone. And then he takes the like chaos equivalent of champion of me he me whatever, kill three dudes. Um, and he's going to do it every time. So, Jason, you like being able to play a team where there's just one badass dude right I like can that, i interest yeah. you can i interest you in hyrotech circle the <laughs> ultimate <laughs> See, badass dude team there was an enormous amount mm. that you were talking about that i was like oh that's exactly the same outlook that i look at for like intercession and for phobos um yeah but i just feel like i would dial it up to 11 and i'm like maybe there's a reason like because of that i would noodle around with the technomancer and like i have the technomancer because i got shadow vaults yeah. And then it's just like more engage, more healing, more resurrection bubbles. And then just it's like you've got one plasma gun, shoot somebody. I don't care. And then just like hammer him back. But you, you've got to be a little tighter with your angles if you don't ignore obscuring. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a grand old time. And, you know, listeners, if you've been brainwashed by these two fine gentlemen, <laughs> tell them at Adepticon when you see them. Yeah. Hang out. I'm I'm excited to go to Adepticon. It's going to be a good time. All right, Shane. Thanks for coming on, as always. You know, talking about the meta to be. Yes, the Hyro heroes yeah. rising up as we speak. Hopefully anyone listening in Rochester, you know, representation. You yeah, shout are, out to Rochester. Guys out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anyone is at Adepticon and wants to say hi to, you know, Jason or Shane, make sure to say hi, because, you know, none of us, it's a small community. So say hi to your new friends. Yeah, I'm planning to arrive like Wednesday night, so I'll be there for a, a big chunk of it. Me too. There's, there's a very, very small slice of slice of a chance that I might make it. But if I am, I'll be busy because I'll be T.O. <laughs> okay, I'm through. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm.
ましたね。